welcome to another episode of Can You Talk Real Quick? Joining me today for the second time together, Dr. Peter Hotez and Dr. Michael Mann. One is a vaccine scientist, the other is a climate scientist. They have a lot in common. They've both been attacked by conspiracy theorists, Republicans, the far right for years. And as a result, they've connected with each other, become friends. And I'm happy to facilitate this conversation between the two of them right now. I'm not going to build up with some big intro. That's not what we do here on Can You Talk Real Quick. It's all supposed to get right to the interview. A shorter conversation, in this case, with two expert guests about really important, very relevant issues that matter to you. In this case, and the respect for the understanding of how science is conducted, how it works, and how conclusions are arrived at. I thought this was a great conversation. These guys have gotten to know each other well. We're talking about already doing this together again in person. Find out more about them and their social media in the show notes. If you want to go back and hear our first conversation, our first three-way, it's episode 482. But here we go right now. Dr. Michael Mann, Dr. Peter Hotez are back at early July 2023. All right. The band is back together. Two brilliant scientists who have had similar experiences being attacked in every possible way. Dr. Peter Hotez, Dr. Michael Mann, we did this back in 2021. I'm very happy to have you both joining me again. Thank you for coming back. Oh, yes, thanks. It's wonderful Great. to be uh, back back with both of you. Two scientists yeah, here. and same a guy here. who can just put you guys up there on the Internet for everybody to hear. It's good work if you can get it. I'm very happy to be hosting you both. First of all, I know that you guys had connected before and you have a kind of a connection. And I wonder about that. I was just talking to Dr. Hotez about it. And obviously he was subject of some pretty high profile attacks, continues to be. Dr. Mann, what is your do you guys talk? Do you guys have some relationship behind the scenes to support each other, you scientists? Yeah, absolutely. Peter's one of my heroes. And, you know, he and other public health scientists have gone through, you know, the same thing that we've been going through. Those climate scientists have been going through uh, for decades. In fact, a few years ago when Anthony Fauci was sort of on the firing line, and he still is, of course, um, an object of attack by the sort of anti-science right. I I wrote a piece for Newsweek, the title of which was, you know, Anthony Fauci, we climate scientists feel your pain because we've been there. We've seen it before. We know the tactics. You know, maybe we have some lessons to offer our friends um, in the, the public health community where there isn't quite the same legacy decades uh, long legacy of, of attack by the right. But now, you know, it's it's really the same thing. We're seeing it. It's equal opportunity anti-science across the board, whether it's yeah. public health or climate or anything that is a threat to powerful vested interests and sort of the, the hordes that often promote their agenda on social media, et cetera. Dr. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, my, Michael's become such an important resource for me because who else do you turn to? I mean, you know, when all the craziness happened a couple of weeks ago and all of a sudden, you know, Steve Bannon is publicly declaring me a criminal. Right. I mean, who do you go to for that? Or Roger Stone goes after you or or Elon Musk. Um, there's no roadmap there. So, you know, tapping into Michael's experience with similar different but similar attacks on on climate science um, was really, really helpful to, because, you know, you say, what the heck's going on? Even this, you know, the scientific societies are caught off guard by this. So yeah. so Michael has just been such a, a friend and such a critically important resource. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. that. Yeah. Uh, right back at you, Peter. I mean, you, you're, you. you're a tremendous resource for, for me too, my friend. So I'm glad to hear that. And I'm sure a lot of people have been reaching out to you. I mean, imagine, Dr. Mann, you've been, you know, attacked by every angle and concerted. Not plan- Bannon. I'm a little jealous here. Yeah, actually. but I was going to say Bannon, Elon Musk, Joe Rogan, and yeah. RFK. I don't think you can beat that, Michael. No, that's like it's it's not the triumvirate. It's something it, it's the whatever the equivalent is. It's the the um, no, I mean, in, in, in RFK Jr. Really, frankly, um, you know, that that's that's a, a major disappointment to me. Of course, he sort of started going in that anti-vax direction a number of years ago. And so it wasn't surprising that he got caught up in sort of the, uh, you know, the, the resurgence of anti-vax sentiment by the right in response to COVID-19. But uh, years ago, I actually used to do interviews like I, I do with you um, on with RFK Jr. He was one of the hosts of uh, Ring, of, Ring Fire. of Fire. Yeah. yeah. 
And, you know, we had great conversations about climate change. And he was completely on the right side of that issue. He was actually a a research scientist or it had it worked in some capacity with National Resources uh, Defense Council. He was on the right side of that science, but you were already seeing him sort of veer off in this anti-science direction on vaccines. And unfortunately, we see where that, yeah. you know, well, led him. The, the big question is, and, and Peter and I talked a couple weeks ago about this when this was all going down, that why don't you debate on Joe Rogan's show. Why don't you agree to these debates? And I think Peter made a really good point in our conversation about Neil deGrasse Tyson went on some very high profile place and it didn't end well. It didn't it wasn't great. It didn't. I think you said, Peter, uh, take the movement forward. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons for that. We've had some some weeks to think and hear about those arguments. But just quickly to you, Dr. Mann, and then back to you, Peter, uh, what did you think? I reached out to Peter and said, are you I hope you're not thinking about this. I don't I don't think this is a good idea. Did you reach out to him or what were your thoughts about the idea of Peter debating RFK on Joe Rogan's podcast? Yeah, I think we did correspond somewhat, uh, you know, uh, about that uh, specifically. But uh, I'll tell you, I was actually asked to go on the Joe Rogan show a number of, uh, well, I don't know, it was a year or two ago to debate climate change with him. And, and I took exactly the same position. It didn't get quite as much attention as Peter got, but I took exactly the same uh, position. And I'll tell you, I'll give you both a very technical explanation and a layperson explanation. The technical explanation is I like to use Bayesian statistics um, is what's known as a prior, which is like you start out with some information when you're looking at, you know, uh, the likelihood of something happening. You can bring some knowledge to bear. Um, you, you're not starting from scratch. It's not, uh, you know, it's not tossing a coin or rolling a die. And the analogy I use is when you get on the debate stage with uh, an anti-science figure, and we see this in, you know, in the science of evolution and creation, my good friend Bill Nye right. once uh, debated Ken Ham, you know, the head of the, uh, you know. The, yeah, it wasn't uh, great. I didn't think Bill was great. And he was well, obviously a lot smarter. Yeah, because the best you can do, that's where the Bayesian statistics uh, come in. You get on the debate stage and you've given the audience a prior. You've told them to start out with the assumption that it's 50 50. Hmm. And you're, you're going to have to spend the next hour or whatever it is. Work, hopefully working back to where the weight of evidence actually is. Ninety nine point nine nine. There was a great segment. I think um, was it. I think it was it wasn't Colbert. It might have been Colbert. It was one of those um, the comedy uh, channel shows where, you know, they actually had Bill Nye invited him on the stage to debate a climate denier. And then they brought out ninety nine additional lab coat wearing. Oh, that's last scientists. week tonight with John Oliver. Oh, that it was John Oliver. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was to, there. The, oh, you were, yeah, because you were the warm up act, right? I'm the fluffer. Yeah. I get to see this stuff. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. So you were there. You saw it, and that's effective. That's an effective use of humor and ingenuity to convey the very technical point that I just made. Right. You're, the best you can do is to hope to get back to what. The science a priori tells us that there's overwhelming evidence. So and you're lending credibility and stature to, to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Right. Well, I, I say something similar, uh, a little bit different, which is, you know, I did my MD and Ph.D. back in New York uh, 40 years ago almost. So I've been a scientist for 40 years. And in those 40 years, I've never debated science. Right. It's not something we do. We we write our papers and submit them for peer review and. And, you know, make make revisions, sometimes major revisions, sometimes it's outright rejected or we present our findings at scientific conferences for a critical feedback, some of it positive, some of it not. And and it works. The system works. But, you know, you don't debate science like you do, you know, 18th century Enlightenment philosophy or <laughs> or polit or politics. It just it's. It's not set up for that. That's problem number one. Problem number two with RFK Jr. is per particularly problematic because he, you know, I've spoken to him an, a number of times over the years and he just keeps moving the goalposts on what his his beef about vaccines is. First, it was the MMR vaccine that caused autism and then thimerosal preservative and then spacing vaccines too close together and alum and vaccines and then a rant on the pharma companies ignoring the fact that we make vaccines outside the pharma companies in the nonprofit sector without 
patents and make low cost vaccines. And then it's, uh, and then it's, uh, the HPV vaccine he claims causes infertility or autoimmunity. And then mm. it's something called chronic illness. So you're, always playing whack-a-mole with him, knocking down one, and it's unproductive. And yeah. and so I, I didn't see that going anywhere. By the way, I've said, I've been on Joe Rogan a couple of times. I thought it, it, there was there were some tough points, but generally I thought it went well. I'm happy to have that discussion with him only because so many people are losing their lives because they're refusing vaccines, and we need to kind of get that he back went on, on this track, but not do a debate. As, as, yeah, uh, exactly. That, yeah. that, that, that's different. Yeah. I mean, what, what Peter said is exactly right. There's a term uh, uh, called the Gish Gallup. It's named after some guy, Gish, in the sort of in the. Um, Actually, I didn't know it was named after a guy named Gish. Now, now I've yeah. learned something good. Yeah, um, in the anti evolution uh, sort of uh, world, um, where, you know, in these anti science debates, their, their tactic is to throw so much mud on the wall, to throw out so many disingenuous and outright false talking points that what you end up. You know, if you're lucky, scraping most of the, the mud off the wall, but you're not going to be able to uh, you know, scrape all of it off the wall. Um, their object, uh, their objective is to tear things down, not to build them. It's much more. Well, what I didn't understand is, you know, Elon's what 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 that was all about saying. I forget what he said. I must be hiding something or I know I'm wrong or something. I mean, where did that come from? Well, that that's a that's no a fair. OK, so that's a. I was going to ask you about that. The Gish Gallup is a rhetorical technique in which a person in a debate attempts to overwhelm their opponent by providing an excessive number of arguments with no regard for the accuracy or strength <laughs> of those arguments. I think it's also called flooding the zone with shit. And yes, we saw that exactly. yes. you know, in, in a macro way with the entire Trump's presidency. All day, every day, he was just tweeting and causing controversy. And, Which brings and we, us back to Steve Bannon, by right. the way. Well, that was his. That was his. That's his idea. I've talked about this a lot. I just talked about this idea with with Jonathan Alter, and it's exactly what you're saying is the technique used rhetorical yeah, so technique. He, he fired, and from my point of view, this whole thing, he fired the first salvo, and and it was all downhill from there after. Well, the 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 question. Answer the question. Pretty simple. What are you afraid of in uh, in debating RFK? On Joe Rogan, first you, Michael. Why, why, why should you be afraid of that? Um, because you know, by getting up there on the debate stage, I'm automatically telling people that his arguments have credibility. Yes, um, yes. The moment you walk on the stage <laughs> or sit next to this person, it's as if they have your credentials, your years of experience. Exactly. In fact, they're just a libertarian comedian. And it's what Peter said as well, by the way, that it, it also misinforms the public about how science works, because science doesn't work through right. debates. Uh, it works through peer review. It works through, re, you know, uh, the you know, the the testing and reaffirmation of findings, the reproducibility of, you know, analyses. Um, there is a methodology for science that is completely betrayed by a firing line like debate yeah know, that's that's uh, a great structure. that's a great word you use betrayed that's right michael so you know but by, by the reason i don't appear with him when i don't particularly want to help him in his in his presidential candidacy um but but also uh i think it it um it it actually sets us back it it in, if you're a young person trying to understand what it means to be a scientist, you think that it's like being going on the Jerry Springer show and it's, <laughs> and it's, and it's not and right. Science is hard work. And, you know, as I tell my graduate students and you know, my postdocs, you know, who get a paper rejected or get a, you know, a grant turned on, I said, if look, if science were easy, everyone would do it. And, and it's, it's, it's hard work and people need to understand that it's not something you just sort of, you know, th throw out there uh, just for kicks and just, just to for entertainment purposes and certainly not to entertain a, a bunch of billionaires with time on their hands. That's for damn sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael, what would what I, I want to just almost punch out of this conversation. I'm just and so enjoying what, as always, watching you two talk to each other. What, what other thoughts do you have about what happened there with that debate, how to go forward, how scientists like yourselves can work together 
to, you know, you're now at Princeton. Or, oh, dear, I'm so sorry. You're now at UPenn. I forget. Much better. Forgive much better me, university. sir. <laughs> forgetting. You on, and you're working on communication. What would you say to Peter and, and your, you know, colleagues in all different kinds of sciences as to how we handle these silly social media stunts to get ratings? Uh, same thing on cable news, et cetera, other places. Yeah, it's a great question. By the way, um, uh, Princeton, unlike Penn, was not founded by one of the great American scientists, uh, Benjamin oh. Franklin. Oh, OK. Well, I'm we, glad we've got we... something up on, on, on Princeton. Yeah, you figure that out. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's. Well, you're I... never going to get a Yale man to say nice things. About <laughs> oh, what have <laughs> I done? What have I done? <laughs> I've got. Uh, yeah, I've got some Yale connections, uh, but uh, as well. Um and there's some Princeton connections in our family. Actually, I've, I've got some wonderful colleagues at Princeton. It's, uh, oh, yeah. No, does there's anybody a, know it's anybody a, at SUNY it, Albany? It, Am I here? Am I here? I have, I, have, I have many colleagues at SUNY. The SUNY. My, my brother-in-law went uh, and my father-in-law both went to Princeton. So I was rooting for them in the NCAA tournament. It was fun to see them make the second round. It was pretty cool. Uh, but, um, but, but, when say they're they're, but but say they're big Joe Rogan fans. How, how do you communicate to them and how do other scientists communicate in a way that's effective? So Ian, and Peter made a really important point um, earlier, which is you, you don't automatically, you know, for, forsake that uh, opportunity. Um, if you have the opportunity to speak to a very large uh, uh, audience that probably has been exposed to all sorts of misinformation and disinformation um, you you have a real opportunity there to inform people and, and you shouldn't take lightly the, the question of whether or not to engage. Right. Um, if the rules are fair and, you know, I, I've gone on Fox News before when I knew I could get a fair uh, interview sure. with John Roberts, who, who was the very first uh, news person I interviewed with back when our original hockey stick article came out mm. in 1998 and uh, I, I, CBS Evening News. He was a, a correspondent, the science correspondent. I spoke, established a relationship. So if I wanted to get a fair interview on Fox News, I can do an interview with John Roberts. And, and to me, that's a win. You've gone into en I enemy agree. territory. I agree. I mean, I, you know, I was doing Fox News interviews early on in the pandemic. I was going yep. on Hannity and Tucker Carlson and hmm. And I, and I appreciated the opportunity and I found it and, it and it weren't well. But what happened was when I stopped going, you know, when the hydroxychloroquine nonsense started coming yeah. up and I wouldn't go along with that, the invitations yeah. just halted, even though the afternoon anchors uh, sort of hung in there with me for a little while till Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram started publicly going after me. But, but you know, to this day, if I get an invitation for any, um, for any of those networks, uh, I, I, I typically will ex will accept. So you're because saying because those are the because yeah. you know if you're really serious about saving lives, I mean, two hundred thousand Americans needlessly perished, yeah, because they refused a COVID vaccine during the Delta and, and BA one Omicron waves. I mean, this is why it's important is that people lost their lives because of anti science disinformation and and if you're serious about saving lives, I think Michael and I both agree it it means count you know using every productive opportunity you can to counter it. Then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you can get a fair interview, yeah. if they're just going to talk over you and bombard their audience again with, you know, misinformation, then, you know, you might be limited in what you can accomplish. But I think that's absolutely right. Um, it is worth at least trying and seeing if you can get a fair hearing, um, you know, in enemy territory, if you like, in conservative media. What do you tell scientists who, you know, don't necessarily have the courage that it might take to speak out the way that both of you have. I mean, both of you, especially recently with Peter, has received the worst kind of threats. And it's just the saddest thing in the world because Peter's vaccines that he's worked with on his team have saved millions and millions of lives, children in developing and, countries. And will probably save millions more. You know, and the yet they're saying that he's yeah. a murderer. They're threatening him. They're coming to his house. That's a reason not to speak out. It's a pretty good reason not to speak out, Michael. Well, you know, and why do you think they do it? <laughs> uh, I mean, that has long been a tactic um, to poison the well, to send, you know, I called it um, you, in the context of my own experiences. I, I coined a, a term, uh, the Serengeti strategy, and it was based on, you know, uh, a, a safari that I, I made to, to the Serengeti at a scientific meeting a number of years ago. And, you know, you, you see the zebras standing uh, back to back, forming a, a wall of stripes. And the reason they do that is then 
not, you know, no one individual zebra stands out um, and, and is susceptible to a, attack by a lion. And so there's the anonymity. And in the, it's the same thing is true in the world of science. If you stick your head up, um, if you speak truth to power, if you engage in messaging that is inconvenient and a threat to powerful special interests, then they will seek you out like the, 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 the lion, um, you know, uh, seeking out that stray zebra that got separated from the herd um, and taking it down. And of course, in that case, it isn't just for a meal. They want to serve notice to other scientists who would consider speaking out themselves. If you try this, we, too, will come, you know, we will come after you, too. That's the whole point. I, but I, I, even with that, you know, Pete, you asked the question. I think young scientists are willing to be out there. And they, right. I mean, the commitment to public services is at an all-time high. I think the key right. is making certain that they know they have the support of their university, of their institution. And the scientific uh, and and, uh, you and know. the societies and everything. Yeah. And, and that's actually where the vulnerability is, yep. because what you're seeing is a lot of the societies, you know, don't want the attention um, uh, or, you know, they say they have to be re remain, quote, politically neutral. But what do you do when the attacks are, are along a partisan divide? And so I think that's where the education process needs to begin is so it's it's not so much the words of the enemies, the silence of the friends that we need to that we need to I think that's the, has the greatest potential to 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 be productive. It, uh, that's right, and Peter. I'll ask you because you know the National Academy of Sciences has, in my view, has been somewhat disappointing in their willingness to, you know, to defend scientists who've been under attack like this. I don't know hmm. if it's any different in the National Academy of uh, Medicine. They tried. They put out. They had a a few weeks ago. They did a, a session on misinformation, but it was you know very high level, very theoretical, right. Right. and you know. It, it, it was hard to apply any of the lessons learned to, to what's going on. So I think, you know, that that that's what we need to really focus on. Um, and, and I understand the difficulties they face because they depend on Congress for for, for right. grants and support. And, and and that is that is the problem. But that that's, I think, something that we can work on in a, yeah. in a productive way. And speaking the, of the other thing I would say, Peter, is absolutely right, that young scientists, you um, you know, really, I, I have been so impressed. Uh, they've grown up in a world where communicating is a natural extension of, you know, just uh, your being uh, the world of social media. It's much more natural for them to engage. And they come equipped with skills that we we didn't have when we entered the fray. And I've just been so impressed with young scientists who are willing to enter the fray, knowing full well the sorts of attacks that they might be subject yeah, to. And Michael, you have an appointment also at the uh, Annenberg School of Communications, right? So you're in a great position to really, you know, start putting those pieces together. What I've been saying is we should be providing scientists at the doctoral, postdoctoral level how to do it. I mean, yeah. we had to learn it by trial and error. In my That's case, right. more, more, error, fire. More, more error <laughs> than trial. And, and, but there, there are a lot of helpful um, lessons learned. And um, so I think, I think the potential is 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 high well, what to do, do you, something. You know what do you say? I'm, I'm glad to hear that from both of you about this generation of scientists. I am, but but the, the fact is, we're all scientists now because we all have an internet connection. I can find whatever I want, cause and effect wise, and then I can tape an interview and I can post it on YouTube. The question, the, the, it seems like it would be harder, TikTok, like, even the, better. TikTok, TikTok. It, everywhere. I mean, you don't need any money. You don't need any vetting editors, nothing. You can just throw something up there. It's even worse or more effective if you actually are an MD. We, we all know that there's all kinds of cranks and, and quacks and conspiracy theorists that have M and D next to their name. So is it getting harder with all the volume of uh, self-selected, self-identified scientists, you know, Google researchers, Michael? Well, I think, you know, the answer to the question, <laughs> you know, it's a rhetorical question. Uh, it, it, it's, it, yeah, of course it is. Um, there's so much noise out there. It's so much more difficult for a person, you know, on the Internet to be able to sift through all of that. And, and noise is sort of neutral. I shouldn't call it noise, right? Because noise is sort of like it's just random garbage. No, there's concerted disinformation that's out there, which is intended intended to misinform. And so as communicators, we don't communicate in a volume in, in a vacuum we we communicate in the face of this stiff headwind of misinformation and disinformation that's promoted 
by bad actors, powerful bad actors. That's right. I don't even call it misinformation or infodemic anymore. I see those are euphemisms because it makes Mm -hmm. it sound like it's just some random junk out there. It's not. It's organized. It's deliberate. It's well financed. It's uh, and it's politically motivated. And now it's called disinformation. That's what now it's and now it's killing people. And and that's why we need. And so, you know, I've had the opportunity, for instance, to meet with Dr. Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization at the end of last year. And and some, you know, political leaders in, in, in the Biden White House to say, this is why we can't be silent. And, you know, because if you're really a scientist, you know, committed to humanitarian pursuits, it's not enough just to make the vaccines or to show the effects of 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 cli- climate change. But also it's part of the job description now, if you're up for it, to combat the, the aggression, the anti-science right. aggression. That's what, yeah, that's, yeah. That's what My I good call friend, it. Uh, Susan Joy Hassel, has, has a, mm-hmm. a great saying, science isn't finished until it's communicated. Ah, um, and, well, and I love that. that. That's great. Yeah. Well, I love this conversation uh, and I want to keep going, but I know th- you both have to go uh, get really, really rich. With all, all that grant the, money, all that government grant money, that, that we're that just sweet. Yeah, I, I, there's this, uh, there's <laughs> this new internet posting that says I'm worth thirty five million dollars, and I say, well, how do you, how does even you get that? I mean, oh. and then it says I'm taking money from the, I think the Chinese Communist Party. Well, or, you don't have to some, know, like, it, I mean, they could, it's, it's absolutely insane, seriously. But <laughs> did we see that video of of you being harassed by a guy at your home? And if you had. Yeah. Millions yeah. of dollars, we would have thought you would have bought <laughs> some clothes that right. you know, or a normal hat. I mean, he looked like a hobo. I mean, right. the only right. thing you feature yeah. that is I had my Houston we Texans uh, t shirt on, and so I, sh- you know, you yeah, can't say that, that was just a PR stunt. I'm sure they said you planned that he's getting money from the Houston. I, I Peter was totally awesome though in the way that he 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 dealt with it so yeah. calmly. Except and, there were some uh, camera angles there that weren't very figure flattering. You so would think with thirty five <laughs> million, you know, we all, uh, yeah. million dollars with all that money, you'd think that Michael Michael Mann would have some kind of hair at this point. Well, right. uh, at, le- you know? at least at least at least the world saw that I live in a fairly modest. Uh, it's a townhome. Yeah, and, uh, townhome. That's, that's, that's millions not where you live if you're worth $35 million. I mean, Pete, I've got enough money. for both of us. So, you know, oh, we well, I don't know later. what we're waiting yeah. for. We, we've been, we, dra- we you've been dragging later. our feet on this. Hair yeah, replacement. We could, we could just, uh, Peter's, you know, and just distribute and, yeah, it. Uh, well, if any of you want to invent a way to transfer Peter's hair onto our heads, I'm fully yeah. in support <laughs> of that conspiracy. Uh, gentlemen. Yeah, that, would, that would be good. So great. I really appreciate it. We got to keep this band going anytime you want to. I love this conversation. Love spending time with Michael. He's the best. Yes, absolutely. Me too, guys. This this is great. Um, We'll do it again, hopefully. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. All the best. There you go, Dr. Peter Hotez and Dr. Michael Mann. You can't find that anywhere but Stand Up, and you can't find Stand Up anymore if it is not able to make a living doing it. Me, that is. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. If you like that, I'll keep pumping it out. Tomorrow, I've got a great conversation with my favorite historian, Kenneth C. Davis, about Independence Day, the Civil War, and more. I think you'll really like that. I'll be talking with Chrissy Greer on Wednesday and so much more, so stay tuned for upcoming episodes all week here on Stand Up. Can't do it without your support, so thank you very much. And I hope you have a happy and safe 4th of July. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creep, keep me.